I'm going to start off this morning with John chapter 3 and verse 16, a, a verse that is often quoted, um, although it's not entirely the greatest translation in some of the translations we deal with, it still does present a, a fact that's pretty incredible when you think about it. You know, because here it says, for God so loved the world, or in this way would be a better way of expressing it, God loved and this is agape. He's expressing, uh, remember, agape is an expression that is done or something that is done for the benefit of the one loved. So for the benefit of the world, he did something. Uh, and this, by the way, in the way that it's uh, arranged, is a single act. So he loved the world when he did something. So in this way, the God loved the world. So that... He gave his one-of-a-kind, unique son. Uh, your, own, your word only begotten there is actually a very specific term that literally means to be one of a kind. It's actually not a word that means to birth. It means one of a kind. He's very unique. And a good example of this, of course, is with uh, Abraham and Isaac. You know, a a Isaac was not his only son. Uh, he had other sons out of the daughters. Um, but so this very unique, one of a kind son that it really doesn't say whoever believes. It says all the ones believing. It's a little bit stronger there. All the ones believing in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, this is where I saw the word everlasting. We were talking about that this morning. It's not everlasting life. It's eternal life. God's quality of life, what it's referring to here. So in the Gospel of Luke, the author goes back into the events that happened on this evening, um, or this night, you could say, that we're referring to. So starting really in Luke chapter uh, 2 is where we begin to pick up on a lot of what is uh, happening. But before we get there, we'll start over in Luke chapter 1. So you see, the reason Luke began to write is something very unique and miraculous happened. The promise of the Messiah, and this will be the promise of the fulfillment to Israel, Israel's king was born. Luke undertook a historical record so that he could actually show, as it references here, to the most excellent Theophilus. And this is in Luke chapter 1 and verse 3. So he could actually lay this out on what actually happened in a chronological order so that we kind of know what happened when it happened. Some of the other Gospels, by the way, are not chronological, and they can skip around a little bit on us, where Luke, he set out very intently to uh, put it in its proper order as best as possible, all the things that happened. Theophilus is an interesting term because we're not sure if it's a person or a reference to the saints, because it literally means one who is a friend of God. That's actually what the word means. Okay. Owed it, and whether he wrote it to most, the most excellent Theophilus, a person, or ultimately the end result, well, I'd say the end result is we actually have a very accurate um, this record of exactly what happened, which is pretty incredible. So most excellent Theophilus, of course, he wrote it so that he would understand these events. Unlike uh, other historical records, by the way, Luke was different because his writing was about a wonderful work that God had done. Okay. A work that would forever change the relationship of humans to God and would bring about the downfall of Satan a work that was wholly unexpected from a human's point of view. And this is interesting because we have the birth of Christ and there is some references in the Old Testament to the uh, Messiah coming. But Israel did not understand that this was going to be God in the flesh. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, here it states, and you need to understand this in context. It says, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. In the context, he's talking about what we have as Christians. 
never even entered the mind of man. It's quite, it's quite that incredible of a story where we never even thought about it in our wildest dreams. From Luke's uh, historic, from Luke's history, it, it tells of something that, like I said, no one could possibly even imagine that God would become flesh. And we see this over in John chapter 1 and verse um, 14, where it specifically references the fact that the word became flesh. Follow the context down. Starting in verse 1, it talks about the fact that, uh, let me jump back up there real quick, because we've got to follow the context to understand what he's talking about. In the beginning was the word. The way it's actually expressed here is it's saying, before there was any beginning, he was. He was already there. And the word was with God. And the word was your second, your third word, God. Well, really here in the context, it's your second word. Actually, could should be translated as deity. He is actually deity. And then you get down into verse 14. And here it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God actually came and wrapped himself in flesh. So stunning was this event that not even the spirit beings could understand it. Now these spirit beings, which refer to uh, angels and seraphim and cherubim, they're all of the ones that God had actually created before he had created mankind. Very intelligent beings. They couldn't understand what God was doing. They'd never seen anything like this before also. So how could God, from their perspective, how could God who created the universe be in the form of a man who is, in, who is created a little bit lower than the angels, and the angels being the lowest rank of the spirit beings? Scripture states, you have made him for a short time a little lower than the angels, you have crowned him with a proper opinion and honor. It states that over in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 7 and 9, where it's referencing that. This was nothing that had been seen before, even though many times the spirit beings had seen the Son of God when he manifested himself to men as messengers of the Lord, also referred to as the angel of the Lord. We get an example of that over in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the, of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not being consumed. Now this, of course, would be Moses. And there's other references where we have the angel of the Lord presenting himself in an outward manifestation of a man, but not like what happened on this night. This is completely different. So it took them all by surprise. This was uh, especially different because one of the members of the Godhead was in the form of a little child. Luke begins his account just before this miraculous birth happens, uh, kind of leading up to it. According to scripture, something had to occur before Christ would be able to come to Israel. Uh, more specifically, the, the prophet actually referenced it as one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert, uh, make straight in the desert a highway to the Lord. So there was going to be a forerunner that would actually come before Christ would come to Israel. Now, of course, is the time for the, for the forerunner to be born. That's where Luke begins his story. Zacharias was a priest who was righteous before God. He and his wife, um, Elizabeth, had walked in the commandments and the ordinance of God. We see that over in uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 8. Um, actually, let me jump over there real quick into Luke chapter 1 and verse 6 is really where I want to go. So let's jump over into Luke real quick. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6. So here in the context, starting in verse 5, it's talking about Zacharias. He was a, a priest after the order of uh, Aaron. And they were both uh, righteous before God, he and his wife. 
Um, in relation to the law, they were actually saved. They weren't saved by the law. They were saved because they believed God was in the temple. And by believing God was in the temple, they obeyed the law because that's what he said. That's why they stood righteous before God. Okay. So he was righteous before God <clears throat> at this point. However, they didn't have a child, which was really important. And as a matter of fact, they not only had, didn't have a child, they were really far beyond the age they knew that this wasn't really possible, but they continued to pray and supplicate to God that they would have a child. And Zacharias was to fulfill his service in the temple as the lot fell on him, as it describes. He was given the task of burning incense, which uh, when he went into the temple of the Lord, that was what he was supposed to do. Because remember, we have a bunch of priests, and each one of them is given a lot. Now it's his time to go in at the particular day and burn the uh, incense in the altar. Okay, that's the task that he was actually given. As he comes in, you know, and by the way, for many hundreds of years, you know, this service had been done in their time, morning and night, as they're supposed to be done. Uh, this started all the way back in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 7, where it says, Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps and shall burn incense on it. And when, and when Aaron's light and the lamps as twilight, he will burn incense on it. Prepare a prepared incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So this was one of the commandments of God. So he was coming in and he was doing something that they've been doing for hundreds of years. You know, very consistently, but this time was going to be a little bit different. Okay. Zacharias entered the temple, and at the side of the altar, a messenger from the Lord stood. Now, oftentimes we translate this as angel. You know, your word angel literally means a messenger. So a messenger from the Lord stood there, and often, you know, in, in the way that they would look, it would actually, in appearance, look like a man. However, there's... A unique appearance about them enough to where Zacharias knew what was going on. Zacharias was overcome by fear when he saw the messenger, but the messenger told him, no, don't be afraid, for his supplication unto the Lord had been heard, and his wife would bear a son whom they would call John. Now, why? You see, John wasn't going to be an ordinary child. John was actually going to be the one who brings joy to many. He would not drink of wine nor strong drink, nor would he, um, he would actually eat uh, honey and locusts would be his food. So he was separated out. Uh, he would be mentally filled by the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, which was not normal back then. So he was mentally filled from his mother's womb by the Holy Spirit. And he's going to tell Israel that the king is coming, and through his ministry, many in Israel are going to actually be turned back to the Lord as a result of that. Now the prophecies were being fulfilled. The Messiah was coming. The forerunner is about to be born. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy with John, the messenger Gabriel sent by the Lord uh, to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. He wasn't coming to Zacharias again at this point, because Zacharias, of course, is in Jerusalem. Rather, he was sent to a young woman who was espoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And we see that in Luke chapter 1 and verse 27. That's where we're actually now, at now. It says, To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So this would be Gabriel that was actually sent at this point. Mary, of course, being the name of the young woman, was troubled by the appearance of the messenger who said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. You know, some of our translations will say graced one, but it's actually one who is, has found favor with God at this point. What manner of salutation is this? This is her response. It's like, no, wait a minute. Why, why are you telling me this? What's going on? Hey. As Mary pondered the messenger's word, he spoke again, and he said, Do not fear, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son who you will call Jesus. Great, and would be called the Son of the Most High. 
and God will give him the throne of his father David. So David's lineage, through them, Christ would actually have a right to the throne. Many years ago, what had happened, if you recall, uh, having found favor in the eyes of the Lord, uh, God gave King David a promise during his reign, uh, especially because David was a man who sought after God's own heart. And it's described as, as that in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 17, where that promise is described. God promised that he would raise up a son to David who would sit upon his throne. His son would be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Father of an Age, and a Prince of Peace. He will save his people from their sins, and to his kingdom there will be no end. All of Israel knew of this prophecy and hoped for the day when their Messiah would come, a day when they would be free from their enemies, a day when they would have all that God had promised them. Because along with this came all of the land promises and the promises of prosperity that God had given Israel. You know, what a wonderful message to hear. Mary would be the one who would bear the Messiah. But of course, there was a problem. And she kind of expresses that here to the, uh, to the angel at this point. Mary had never known a man. So she was very perplexed on the how, she, how this could happen. How will this come to be since I have not known a man? Gabriel then revealed to her that the Spirit would come upon her for the holy thing that, would bear, that she would bear would be called a son of God. And we see that in uh, verse 35 as you move down as he's talking about that. And by the way, this is very important to pick out that he very clearly says, not that holy one, but that holy thing. That's important because God was going to create a body in her womb without the male. This is extremely important when you understand that the reason this is done is because the sin nature of mankind transfers through the blood, transfers through the man who sinned. Eve transgressed, but the man knew full well what he was doing. And the man, I'm referring to Adam, he knew what was going on. And because of that, the, the nature that we have, that bent nature, is transferred down through the male. So we now have a body that's being created that doesn't have a sin nature. And God the Son God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are all going to be involved with this. And scripture, by the way, does actually say the holy thing to be born in you. This is not a person that God controls. This is actually God in the flesh. That's who it's going to be. So the body is just a thing at this point. So this isn't going to be any normal uh, birth by any means, because no male, of course, could be involved. We see over in, let's see, John chapter 1, verse 1, as it talks about in the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was actually going to come, the one who existed before all creation, and he was going to be born as a human. The seed of the man, of course, as I said, is so corrupt that it couldn't, uh, couldn't possibly make a suitable body for the Son of God, so the Father made one for him. Therefore, the, the, fa the Father and the Son actually prepared a body for him, one that was free from that nature. The child that grew in, in Mary's womb was, like I said, no ordinary child. Yes, it had a soul and a spirit just as humans do, but the Son of God is the one who supplied the person. When we were talking about um, Christology, it's really important to understand that he is fully human. He came as a human, yet he is fully God. Because he didn't give up his deity when he did this, but the manifestation of God is actually going to happen now. In a way that we as humans should be able to understand. Because he's coming as one of us, as another human. Mm -hmm. The second person of the Godhead took on an outward form of a servant and was found in the likeness of man. 
He would personally fulfill the promise of David and sit upon the throne. The Messiah of Israel had waited, that waited, that Israel had waited for for so long, was now really none other than God Himself, where He's going to fulfill that promise. Unknown to any man or spirit being that God had determined before they created anything that God the Son would actually take on the outward form of a, of a man. And we see that in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 where he says, He indeed was um, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times to you. An expression of love like this is quite incredible. An expression of love to humans, God the Father gave his only one-of-a-kind unique son to the world, and all those who believe will be given eternal life. That quality of life that God has. For God, who at various times and, and in many ways spoke to Israel and the prophets, now in these last days, he's going to actually speak to them through a son a son who would be the radiance of his glory and exact representation of his substance. That is what the Son of God was. Now, why the gift? Why is it necessary for humans to believe in the promise related to Jesus Christ? Now, why is God off offering eternal life? Now, these are some very serious questions. The, Thousands of years ago, Adam disobeyed God, and as a result of that, all mankind came under judgment. See that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 18, where it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all, resulting in condemnation, even though, or even so, through one man, righteous, one man's righteous act, the free gift of, to all men, resulting in justification of life. I'm um, talking about uh, the, the, the gift and why we had this gift and the fact that um, as a result of Adam's sin, all of mankind came upon, um, judgment came upon all mankind. On the top of that, Adam passed on not only the judgment, but he also passed on the effect of the trespass to, and his nature to us. Therefore, all men are under slavery to the sin nature, to a nature that's bent to do things that are wrong, even though all mankind knows the difference between good and evil. They're bent towards that way because of what Adam did. So although Adam sinned, as I said earlier, Eva, who was with Adam, she didn't sin. She was thoroughly deceived. She was thoroughly deceived by Satan, who used a serpent to get her to disobey God and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result, both Eve and the serpent and Satan were given specific punishments. The significant part about this punishment is that within the punishment, God actually gave a promise to Satan that the seed of the woman would crush him. He was actually going to use the seed of a woman, which is quite interesting back in Genesis when he references that. And therefore, he promised humans that God would save them through this man. Since the nature of Adam is passed on to all his descendants, all men are under condemnation. Therefore, of course, how are we going to find a savior from us when all of us are actually condemned? God didn't say he was actually going to bring about the seed of a man. He said the seed of a woman. This is very important again because Jesus was going to be born of a virgin, which means the man wasn't going to be involved. God was actually to create something. And since the, man, since the seed of man wasn't involved, the birth of Christ, he's not under condemnation. The nature didn't pass over. He could actually save us from our sins. Now, Gabriel, in announcing to a virgin and spouse to the descendants of David that she will give birth to a son through the work of the Holy Spirit to fulfill God's promise and bring salvation to mankind. The reality is nothing is impossible to God, and that's been shown. Uh, for even Mary's uh, cousin Elizabeth was with child. Now remember, as we started the story, they were beyond their years of being able to have children, yet God actually worked it out. That's a pretty incredible thing in itself. 
she was about to bear the forerunner of the king. What could Mary's response be at this point? Before her is a messenger from the Lord telling her that she would be the one to bear the Messiah, the Savior of her people. What an incredible privilege this would be. Oh, but there was another problem. She's married. Well, in spoused, back then, that's, that's as good as being married. She's in spoused to Joseph. They have not come together yet, but the contracts have already been signed. And to man's knowledge, there's only one way for a woman to become pregnant. You know, from man's perspective, that's the only way. So when Mary was found with child, of course, this was a problem. Infidelity, even as a finance, even as a fiance, was totally unacceptable and was often punished by death. However, Joseph was a just man and he didn't wish to publicly disgrace Mary. Therefore, he had determined that he was going to release her privately. However, while he's pondering this, the messenger of the Lord appears to him. He appears to him in a dream at this point. And he tells Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that thing which is conceived in her, and it does reference it as a thing again, is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and, he shall, um, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this was done so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bring forth a son, that will, and we will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph did as the messenger of the Lord had instructed him and took Mary as his wife. Only, of course, at this point, neither of them truly understood the impact this child was going to have on humanity. In one expression of love to the whole world, God gave his one-of-a-kind unique son, a child that was born of a virgin, of the seed of a woman, not under condemnation, and none other than God the Son himself, the second person of the Godhead. Although God the Son existed, outward, uh, existed in an outward form of God, he did not require or regard an equal outward manifestation of his deity is something to be grasped, but he emptied himself of his appearance, that's his outward appearance, and received the appearance of a slave, coming to be in the likeness of man, and found an appearance according to man. He was no less God at this point, but now he had taken on the outward appearance of a man and was living among men as they do. So much so that he would be born just like a man. During Mary's pregnancy, uh, Caesar Augustus makes a decree that the inhabited world would be uh, registered. This is actually kind of important because they're not actually in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where the, the prophet said that the, son, that the Messiah would be born. Okay, they're in a different place. So as a result of this, census, of this census, all were to go to their own city, the city of their kinsmen, to be counted. So Joseph was of the lineage of David. He and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to the city of David. As a matter of fact, actually, both of them were ultimately of the lineage, which is kind of interesting. But that's, for, that's a story for another day. The spring of that year, they arrived in Bethlehem. Uh, during their stay, Mary, uh, Mary's time had come for delivery. The Son of God was on the verge of coming into the world. However, as a result of the census, there was no place left in Bethlehem for them. All the rooms of the end were taken, and therefore the King of Israel, the Messiah, who would save his people and sit upon the throne of his father David, who would have a kingdom that would never end, was born and laid in a stall, a place where animals ate. And this is, of course, not a place where kings sleep. But that's where he was actually laid, because of all that was going on. This was not what Israel had expected. They were expecting the Messiah to march into Israel in full glory as a king and defeat their enemy once and for all. 
Although many had turned from their expectation of the Messiah, there were still some who continued to take God at his word. Of those were some who knew of the prophecy of old, that of the time of the Messiah, a star would be seen in the heavens and would keep and they were keeping a watchful eye out in the heavens to see when the king of Israel would be born. These are actually referred to as the Magi, um, also known as the uh, three wise men. Uh, scripture actually calls them the Magi. They were ones who watched the sky. Yeah. And they saw this, this star appear. Now they knew from an older prophecy that when this happened, the king of the Jews would actually come. This prophecy was back over in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, where it says, I see him, but now I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. That's the only reference to a star showing up, but they understood it. Now, they're not Israel, but they understood scripture. You know, yeah, I don't think the Magi were actually uh, um, Israelites. But they understood from Scripture that when that star appeared, the king of the Jews was coming. And they went. They began to travel towards him. Now, on the night of Jesus' birth, there were shepherds in the field uh, tending to their flock, as they would often do. And suddenly a messenger from the Lord appeared. The glory of the Lord was shining all around them. Um, which, of course, caused them to uh, be in great fear. However, the messenger spoke and reassured them that they shouldn't be afraid, for he was bringing them a message of great joy. This very day in the city of David, a Savior was born, one who would be called Christ the Lord. The announcement went out. What a truly wonderful message and a tiding of great joy, not only to the Jews, but also to all people, because, yes, he came for the Jews, but the Gentiles would benefit also. As a sign to the shepherds, they would find a young infant wrapped in clothing lying in a manger. This, by the way, indicates it's a very unique situation. Or in other words, there weren't a whole lot of babies laying in a manger at this time. There was one, and this was a sign to them. So they're going around looking. Now, as, of course, the messenger says this, suddenly, as, you know, as the messenger is speaking, a multitude of the heavenly hosts appear praising God. Glory in the highest to God and, and um, on earth peace among men of good pleasure. This would have been, well, this would have been massive. This would have been a spectacular, I mean, just incredible. Not only did the messenger of the Lord appear, but a host of, of our army, you could also reference it, of heaven appeared in the glory and, and full manifestation so that um, it would be assigned to them. And after all this was done, the shepherds said unto themselves, well, let's go to Bethlehem and see what's happening, since they were told about this. With haste, they began their journey to Bethlehem, the city that uh, the prophets um, foretold was the, where the king of Israel would be born, and where they um, found a child just as the messenger had told them. After the shepherds had seen the child, they told all about what they had seen and heard and returned glorifying and praising God. So they actually spread the word all over the place because of what they saw. Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of Herod. The Magi at this point, they're coming down, and this is a few years later, where the Magi who had seen the star, the significance of the coming of the, of the king of Israel, they understood. They traveled to Judea seeking him. And as they traveled through the country to find the child, they were asking, of course, where is the king of the Jews? Herod became aware of this and inquired and was troubled to hear about this new king because, of course, he was appointed as king by the Romans. And the Romans, at this point, were ruling over Israel. So this new king would, would pose a great threat. Therefore, Herod calls them together. Well, actually, what he first did was he called the scribes and the priests together, and he said, hey, where is this, where this king of the Jews supposed to be born? They quickly informed him that it would be in the uh, city of Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, 
Herod spoke with the Magi secretly to find out where this, uh, when this star had appeared and sent them to Bethlehem seeking out the child, asking them, you know, when they find him, come and tell him because he wanted to worship him also. He didn't. It's another story for another time. As the Magi left to continue his search for the, or to continue their search for the child, for the child, and that star, which they had seen in the east, it came and it uh, stood over where the child was living. As they entered the house and saw the child with Mary, they fell down and they worshipped him. Uh, this is one of the interesting parts of the story because the wise men didn't come on the night in which Christ was born. He was a couple of years old when they actually came. Um, he wasn't in a manger at this point. Uh, that had already happened and was assigned to the shepherds at that point. But the Magi understood who he was. And they came and they bowed down and they worshipped and they brought their gifts. Yeah. They, their journey had, took, had taken them almost two years. They had finally found him. And here, of course, is the, the king, the savior of the Jews. Now, out of respect, they brought uh, the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts fit for a king. And it's interesting how later these were used when, when uh, to flee to Egypt. Because, you know, in prophecy, God said, I will bring him out of Egypt. So he actually did that. This is actually an incredible story that oftentimes we hear so many times. But, you know, God actually came in the flesh. God fulfilled the promise to Israel. Now, Israel did ultimately, at this point, they rejected God. But their rejection was something that God actually used for us as, as, uh, as Gentiles. See, the birth of Christ was uh, the fulfillment of the promise to the Jews. Through him, God would bring about the promise of the land prosperity. It was also through Jesus that God would save the Jews from their sins. However, when the Jews rejected him, because you see it in, in John chapter um, 1 and verse 11, it says, he came to his own and his, his own things, more specifically, and his own people didn't receive him. They didn't receive him. As a result, salvation is offered to all men. They stumbled, but not that they should fall, rather so that salvation would come to the Gentiles. God is still going to save his people. He's still going to save Israel. But at this point, he's allowing an opportunity for the Gentiles to be saved. So as we go about this Christmas season, for those of us who are saved, let us remember that it was this gift that God gave to the world, the gift of his unique, one-of-a-kind son, that is the reason we take time to celebrate this. As we give gifts and share with family and others, may we keep in mind a focus of who we are in Christ. For in Christ, all things have become new to us. For in Christ... God expresses his love towards us constantly, not just a single act like he did with the world system. The one act of love that God showed the world so long ago, of course, made all this possible. Since this one act of love was so great, imagine what things he has in store for us who love him. Imagine those things. A love so great that he actually calls us, being Christians, sons of God. It's absolutely incredible when we understand that. For those of you who have not taken God at his word for salvation, salvation comes by faith through faith. Comes by faith through grace alone. Grace is God's attitude whereby he gives a benefit without consideration of merit. That means God is not looking at whether you deserve it or not. God is offering it freely. For those of you who are seeking a how to be saved, this benefit is also being extended. God is not, like I said, he's not looking at whether you deserve salvation. He's freely offering salvation. Simply take God at his word. Remember, faith is always based upon a promise. It is the substance of that which is hoped for, the evidence of accomplished deeds. God sent his son, and ultimately his son died. He died as a sacrifice for us. But it all started on this night that we take an opportunity to remember the night in which 
God himself became flesh. That's an incredible thought. He walked among us. The promise of God, of course, for us today is that we are to believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We believe this and we're saved. 